Welcome to your London Press meeting. My name is Mark Hershjo, and the topic I was given is update on autologous breast reconstruction. The fact is that you can offer an implant-based breast reconstruction, which is a good idea, and a lot more people can do that operation. But lately, there's been a lot of negative factors on breast implants, such as the BII, ALCO, so people are getting a little bit worried about it. External prosthesis is not a bad idea. The material has got better. The coloring has got better. So a lot of it is patient's choice and what they would like to have. My personal opinion is like using your own tissue is a great idea because it's nice and soft. It's your own. You never have to worry about exchanging it. And despite having the scar, it would last you forever. Now, so if you've been in the business for a relatively short time, the fact is that there's nothing really new in the world of autologous breast reconstruction. So if that's the topic I have to give you, we can all go for coffee until the next sessions. But if you're as old as me, then the evolution of the whole autologous breast reconstruction has jumped leaps and bounds, and it has been quite exciting in my time in this field. It all started off with pedicle flap, which is transpositions of local tissue from somewhere close by into the breast with its own blood supply and continuing being supplied by the same vessels. So it's robbing Peter, giving it to Paul, leaving a scar from the donor site. I mean, I'm not that old, but it all started in the late 18th century when Tassini used the latissimus dorsi flap. Has it really made any different changes since then? It's still using thoracodorsal artery. It's still moving from the back to the front. And it's a great operation. So I think with 100 years of practice, most people get really good at it. Good news is that it's relatively reliable. The vessels is big. You only get a scar at the back. But the latissimus dorsi, even with the skin pedicle, pedo is only about 100 to 150 cc in general. So most ladies' breasts are a little bit bigger than that. And therefore, you require an implant. So we're going back to the fact that you need an implant, which has the issues with the BII, AOCL, rupture, capsular contractures, and the problem associated with radio therapy. And also, this muscle, it is the biggest muscle in your body. And by taking it from the back, and despite a lot of literature say, no, most people can get on with real life, I think there is a limitation with shoulder movement, and some of the elderly I see who had breast reconstruction years ago find it difficult in pushing themselves out of a chair. And sometimes when they cough, it still twitches despite removing the nerve that supplied it. The improvement over the time in the last probably 20 years is due to the extended LD, which means you take the subcutaneous tissue with the muscles along with the skin pedal. It's a good operation, but if you look at someone's back, which I think is a major problem to me personally, is that you take subcutaneous tissue from one side, there is a contour difference between the two, and most people look in the front and say, great operation, but I re personally, I do not really like the back. So that is why I have not ticked this on as one part of my practice. Okay, going back to the last century in 1980, there's a very clever surgeon in Atlanta called Hart Trump who decided that you can take the lower abdominal penis, which has a reasonable amount of tissue in most people, with the rectus muscles, and you can then transpose it into the breast area. What it is is based on the superior epigastric artery, which runs behind the rectus muscles and supply the abdominal penis. Once you transfer it up to the top, you can trim off the non-viable tissues, and you can mold it. There are few issues with these operations. Because the superior epigastric artery is the smaller vessel out of the two, it does not supply a large area, so a lot of it has to be removed. Secondly, you have to protect that very tiny vessel, and therefore you have to keep the rectus muscle with the whole pedal, and therefore when you transfer it up to the top, what you are missing is the big piece of muscle to protect your core strength, and your abdomen. Therefore, you have a higher risk of abdominal hernia and bulging. And this turning of the muscles always gives some knuckling. So some of the ladies that used to have this surgery, you can find there's a little bulge right at the lower part of the sternum. With the introduction of microsurgery, things have transformed, and 
with time, the equipment has got better, the microscope has got better, not sure surgeons has got any better, we're just old. But this means that we can use the inferior epigastric artery, which comes from the lower end, and it's the main dominant vessel that supply the skin flap. It's also closer to the lower abdominal penis where we want to harvest. And we can detach it, join it into the internal mammary artery, which is behind the rib, or you can connect it to the thoracodorsal artery using microsurgical technique. Now, with the vessels being bigger and larger, that means you can take, hopefully take a larger piece of abdominal tissue for the larger breast patients. Also, you can then leave the upper part of the rectus muscle behind, making it a smaller area where you're going to have abdominal bulge or a hernia. With the use of putting a mesh behind it, it further reduces it, but you're still missing something to, for your core strength. As technique and microscope all get better, we decided that actually we don't need the whole piece of muscle. We can even eliminate it and start calling it a muscle sparing tram. Then with time even going further, we find that actually we can take one or two of the perforator, which came from the blood vessels through the muscles into the skin and the subcutaneous tissues. But that means all you have to do is tease off the muscles and then you can pull the whole vessels out, leaving the muscles behind and reducing any further risk of harming the abdominal core strength. Some very clever surgeon in uh, New Orleans decided that, yes, yeah, sometimes you do need two or three perforators, but you do have the nerve running across, supplying the, button, uh, supplying the rectus muscles, and if you have two, two or three perforator, you may have to cut it. So instead of cutting the nerve, he decided he can cut the perforator and then rejoin it together and call it an apex flap. It's a good surgery. It's a little bit of a challenging part, but it's, if you can do most microsurgery, it's pretty much the same, but it's just increasing the time, and at least you call something new and name after yourself. Ultimately, whether you use a perforated flap or you use muscle sparing, or you take the whole tram. We find that it can supply up to about three quarter of the abdominal uh, skin and muscles. And the zone four area, which is furthest away on the other side, they usually have some issue with what we call venous congestion or arterial supply. So because it's a little bit unreliable, most of the time we removed it. But that would mean that Despite having a reasonable sized penis, we actually always lose some in majority of the cases of reconstructions. So the development nowadays with the improved in equipment and technique, some people said, right, okay, we take both the inferior epigastric artery and vein, join it up together like they did in all different variations. That means we can stack the tissues together and get more volume. What you're doing is actually getting more extension laterally to just get more volume into reconstructions. You can argue that, say, that this is a great idea, this is a good technical challenge, but now with the introduction of fat transfer, is that really necessary to do more microsurgical technique? Even though we have got better, there is still a risk of complications. Just for on the development front, there's also what we call SIEA flap, which is using the superior epigastric artery coming inferiorly, which is on the top layer of closer to the skin. It's just a different vessel supply, but it does not go through the rectus muscle and it's easy to harvest very quick. But the angiosome and the distribution of that vessel usually mean you can only take half the flap safely. So it's got its advantage point by not damaging the abdominal muscles, but it's got a disadvantage point of having less tissue being used. And in some very clever person did a study that only 11% of people have these vessels because of previous cesarean sections or it simply does not, it's not big enough for the uh, microsurgical work. So I keep on talking about improvement in the equipment we use. And I think that's very important because surgeons remain the same group of people, we're just getting older, or to some newer guy, maybe I mean, there are lots of people better than me. But it's the equipment that help us to improve what we do. So surgically, because we now have 
microscope with better so, uh, magnifications, we have finer instruments, we can now preserve the nerve, preserve the muscle in the abdomen. Meaning that the abdominal uh, trauma that we used to have is now getting less, which is very important. The last thing you want is the donor side causing the patients more problems than your reconstructions. Technically, what else have we done in the last 10, 12 years to help it, the pathway of getting the patient better besides having wonderful people like Kerry to, to help us with the looking after the patient, helping them psychologically? Technically, we've been demanding to have two surgeons to operate in theatre. That means we reduce the operating time. And we know that shorter operating time will improve the recovery of patients because they have less anesthetic gas, they don't lie there as long, less chance of a DVT. And we also provided what we call tap block, rectus sheath block to the abdomen to reduce the amount of discomfort in the abdomen after the dissection in the DF flap. Better pain control from the anesthetist, giving them post-operative oxygen therapy, quilting the abdomen to reduce the rumor. All these help us to make it a better journey for the patients and improve the success rate of the whole surgery. Now, we've talked about DF flap, which is the number one autologous reconstruction, because most people have a reasonable size abdomen. But unfortunately, some people really don't. And no matter how much you squeeze it, you're not going to get much out of it. And if the choice is having autologous reconstructions, we have to think of alternative. So we talk about DF flap, DF flap with a bit of fat grafting. We can stack it by doing both vessels. <laughs> And the only other part of the body where you can harvest some reasonable amount of tissue is the back. So the first one that we do probably as a second choice is what we call the S-gap, just basing on the superior gluteal artery. And we just take the perforated, dissect it through the gluteal muscles, and chase it down. Good surgery, good results. Downsides are that you can only pinch so much from the backside, and most of the time you can only get into about B cup, nothing more than that. And obviously you do flatten one side of the buttock, and some ladies really do not like that. And the tissue is slightly harder and shorter, and that means in some cases you do notice some tissue missing from the top. But the introduction of fat transfer help us to do small surgery to improve the contour, so making this a good second alternative. Other flaps are what we call a TMG or the tuck flap, which is a transverse skin pedal taken with the gracilis muscle, which runs down in the thigh. As we all know, the gracilis muscle doesn't really serve much purpose in life, and so it can be taken away without causing problems with the uh, patients. It's got reasonable size vessels, but it's a small flap. So, but the donor site is very good because it's right in the groin crease. And sometimes we do what we call a double tuck flap because of the limited volume we can harvest from each side. And this is some of the newer dis uh, discovery by surgeon is that most of the time we do it to the internal memory artery and vein. And we find that the enteral flow that we normally, and it's the most the uh, tissues to, we can also, and it's the most, a second tissue to what we call the retrograde coming from the rectus side. So therefore, you can join two flaps on the same blood vessels, whether they're flowing forward and backward, and therefore you can put two flaps in at the same time, and that will increase the volume and help it. This is a very good surgery, good scar, downsized truly is the volume we can harvest it on most people. Then someone move it on to what we call a path flap, which is the uh, perforator just behind the grassless, which is just simply some people have more tissue on the back of the thigh rather than the inner thigh. Just an alternative, shorter vessels again, and smaller volume, just as the other one. The final one that people now use is what we call the left flap, which is the lumbar artery perforator flap. They are the, I presume it's called muffin top, which is just sitting above the gluteus area. And some ladies do have a reasonable amount. There is a very small perforator coming through to supply that area. The true downside is that that segment of vessel is relatively short. And if you can imagine that on some ladies, after you remove the ribs, the little hole that we can expose the internal memory artery and veins is relatively deep. 
and dead vessels have difficulty in reaching that distance. And if that's the case, we have to do what we call a vein graft. That mean we harvest a long strip of vein, join it up together just to give it a bit of lengthening, just extension of the pipe. Other things we have been doing a lot more nowadays are the oncoplastic because neoadjuvant chemotherapy is doing so well in many ladies. I'm not here to talk about whether which type of oncogenes is, works better, but some of the ladies with, uh, with neoadjuvant chemotherapy shrink the tumor so nicely that some of the surgeons feel that you can do a lumpectomy without doing a full mastectomy. And if that is the case, we don't need to do a full breast reconstruction using large pieces of tissues like the DF, the tuck, or SGAP. We can use small things like the oncoplastic reconstruction by removing it and using breast reduction technique and mastopexy technique. We can rotate tissues and keep something nice. This lady has breast cancer on the left side of which we were able to remove the tumor and reduced and closed it. And then the opposite side, just simply use a vertical scar breast reduction and get a relatively symmetrical result, and she was overall happy. The other alternative would be use what we call a Tdap or a Lycap flap. They're just, just uh, terminology. The Tdap flap is basically the thoracic artery perforated flap, which is what supplied the latissimus dorsi. Through the time, people are trying to stop using the latissimus dorsi because keeping at the back it's much better for the patients in all power and uh, posture. The perforator basically comes out from the edge of the, the anterior edge of the muscles. So you can, if you only need a relatively smaller area and don't need a huge volume, you can then take the skin pedal with just the perforator and then swing it to the anterior part. So this is what we get. And it's very good for those contracted area that people have performed previous lumpectomy and radiotherapy and causes distortion, or you can even use it immediately at the same time of surgery to prevent distortions. So what other instrument besides microscope and forceps and uh, scissors that we use that has helped us over the time? I think CT angiogram has transformed most of our practice in that it identified the perforators that supply or is the biggest perforator with the shortest dissection course. Shorter dissection course means that we don't have to damage the muscle as much. Identifying which one is the biggest perforator means that we can reduce operating time. It's just homing in on that vessels rather than look at all of them and say, oh, which one is bigger? Surgically, I think, at least in my practice, I think the thing that transformed my practice the most is what we call the coupler. A venous coupler is a little two tubes. Basically, you just put the two ends of the vein together and push it together, and then it will just join up, like you're doing some plumbing. What it does is form a rigid form to keep the vein patent, so therefore it's less prone to external compressions and less chance of it to have... Um, turbulence flow and causing um, uh, thrombosis of the vein, which is majority of the cases when the autologous flap don't work. Ever since the introduction of coupler, we are finding it uh, much less problem with the flap, or at least for us to take back on the same night, because the vein we know now works so much better. And the other thing that I think we should all have, but unfortunately most units find it a little bit expensive to buy, is the um, I can never, the fluorescence uh, spy or ICG type to identify the blood flow. So once you've done a mastectomy, you leave a very skin flap, you do the autologous anastomosis, you have, you're not quite sure that it's flowing through the whole piece of tissues. So whatever is non-viable, if it can be removed at the time of the initial surgery, that would mean that you have less chance of fat necrosis, less chance of these melting substances causing infections, less chance of the wound breaking down, having the patients being taken back on months and months of dressings. I think it's a brilliant idea, but until the price can come down, I think it is very hard. I think the spy itself machine is about quarter of a million pounds. That hopefully, it has come down in price. And there are smaller machines 
but not quite sure they work just as well. So sorry to give you a history lesson, but truly speaking, there's nothing really new in the last few years. But so what's next? What's the tail end of my career is going to expose to? I mean, Fed graph is definitely the number one thing. I mean, we're definitely doing way more Fed graft nowadays than 10 years ago. I, when I started becoming a consultant, there was still a paper on Fed engineering, whether Fed will survive if you transfer it to, into another area. Nowadays, Fed graft to the breast is a standard practice. Downside is most of us can only get a small amount of Fed in and making it survive. There are people who claim that you can rebuild the whole breast with just Fed graft. I can't see it. And technically, I don't think I can do it. So it's very interesting that people can do it. Hopefully, the technique of harvesting and delivering the fat will improve, and therefore, we can have more volume. Professor Koshima in Japan is a pioneer of what we call ultra-microsurgery. He has the patience of a saint. He can sit in front of a microscope probably for the whole day doing really, really fine vessels. And he is one of these guys that keep on pushing the field forward, manufacturing really fine equipment, and now he can do a perforator to perf uh, anastomosis, and you can do it and the flap will survive without us dissecting more. So what he's preventing us is to chase down to the vessel with a bigger uh, caliber for the surgery. So if you have better equipment, better visibility, better techniques, you can do it with a shorter distance. But for breast reconstruction, one of the true downside is the way we join the two. Because as they say, the two most common sites are the internal memory artery, which is right behind the rib. And normally we take out the third rib, at least the third intercostal cartilage, to get down to that field. Some people prefer the thoracal dorsal artery, which is right in the axilla. So there is a big long distance to do it. So if you only have a small section or small segment of the pedicle or blood vessel, it's very difficult to get into that field. So we have to do bigger incisions, open a few more to at least get the tissues in. This is one of the limiting factors of trying to get do smaller vessels, is to get to the excess size without damaging the local area. Neurotization is another issue. I mean, most DF lab have no sensations. Patients said, yes, I can do feel something on the skin, but really because the breast itself is supplied by the second to the fifth intercostal nerve. Which one do you anastomose it to? And which little nerve on the skin do you anastomose it? So we haven't got anywhere near that. Some people have tried, but not to a lot of success in the last 20 years. Lymphatic drainage is definitely the bane of our life. As some patients unfortunately develop lymphoedema, and it's really sad that they develop it, but we still don't know who gets it and who won't. Some of the sentinel lymph node patients even get it. I think Da Vinci robot is one of the best inventions and may come into play even for plastic surgery because it can work in a field that you can't even visualize it. It can go 90 degrees around the corner and if that is the case, that means I do not have to have a massive exposure or at least try to get down there. I can get the vessels tunneled into certain area and the Da Vinci arm can actually get into it. It's simply time when they develop finding equipment. As I said, the two future that we need to explore is definitely sensory neurotizations and the treatment of lymphoedema. There are lots of people claiming they have good results with doing lymphatical venous anastomosis, lymph node transfer, but it's still not popularized and it's still not benefiting most patients yet. It's still only a very small amount of patients that benefit from those surgeries. 3D printer is definitely very exciting. I'm not going to quite sure that I'm going to see it in my lifetime, but hopefully that will transform the surgery and we can grow a breast and then use it in the future. Thank you very much.